Um, I'd like to introduce Jane Keezy, who's come from America. Um, she's been at how many of our conferences? About four now, the past four years. And she stays at my house, so she's really brave. Um, and um, she's a fantastic speaker, and she's written about all sorts of topics. Most notably, um, her work with education and teachers has been really groundbreaking. But she's also worked with uh, leadership and coaching and all sorts of things about type spirituality, you name it, Jane knows it. So I'm not going to take up any more of your time. So, Jane, are you ready to yeah. go? Thank you. Jane. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not checking messages on my phone. This is my remote. Just uh, <laughs> to make that clear. But I think we were going to dim the lights. Where's the switch so that the slides are easier to see? Um, and I'm taking that risk after a lunch. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to keep you awake in all of this. Um, because it's, it's good to see what we're looking at. I started researching for this talk uh, as soon as I knew I was going to be doing it with all of you. And uh, Jung's Red Book sits on my shelf. And I thought, ooh, what image would bring you know, life to type? And so this is one of um, the images from Jung's Red Book welcoming us all today. And how many of you have looked at Jung's Red Book? You know, adult coloring books have been around for a long time. <laughs> um, just amazing looking at his, um, are adult coloring books catching on? Yeah. 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 Okay, the best cartoon I've seen in, in months was, or it was actually a, a joke where, you know, 2045 and the grandson is asking grandpa, how did Donald Trump become president? And the grandpa said, oh, we were distracted. That was the year adult coloring books came out. <laughs> so um, I think I'm over jet lag enough if anyone wants to know anything else about the elections. But um, other than that, uh, I also learned that, do you realize that you are in the same town for this convention uh, as the Roald Dahl Museum? And this year is the 100th anniversary of his birth. And you gave the opening of the conference to the librarian's daughter, English major. And I can't tell you how much fun I had also researching by rereading The Witches and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and the BFG and the Twits and everything else. And I couldn't help but think about that fabulous moment when the suspense is broken in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And he has the golden ticket and he's welcomed to his tour of the chocolate factory and told that he'll have a lifelong supply of chocolate. And a full day being toured around that chocolate factory by Willy Wonka himself. But of course that tour starts by going to a classroom where he's going to learn about chocolate because you can't appreciate and taste chocolate until you've taken pre-chocolate training, right? So you need to go to Cocoa 101 and you need to learn about the geography of the places that cocoa comes from. So, I mean, this is what you need to do, right, in order to appreciate something. And you need to memorize um, the meanings of the different pod colors, you know, what the rightness of each one would mean, and how to climb the trees to gather the cocoa. And when you've got all that down, then you need the chemistry piece of learning about chocolate. I mean, how is it that those beans that are wrapped up in lemon-flavored fibers become the beans that we can roast? Your, your, your fire safety certificates are all current, right, so that we can get to roasting coffee beans and talking about that and memorizing the 16 different types of coffee beans and everything else, because that's what you need to do, right, before you taste chocolate, is learn all about it. Um, are some of you bored? You just want to get to the chocolate? Well, I'm trying to prepare you, you know, for the facts, the factory admission tests. We need to be ready for these things. But of course, it would be a nightmare, wouldn't it, if we had to do that before we actually entered the world of chocolate. We're going to the world of you instead of chocolate. Aren't you relieved that we can just leap into the wonderful world of um, Carl Jung and imagine him greeting us today with all the wonders he has to tell us about the world of type instead of the world of chocolate. And of course, he'd take us into his magical world of how we can save our marriages through type and how we can learn to get along better in our organizations and how we can raise healthy children and stay healthy ourselves. And all we need to do to access that world of Carl Jung is go to the classroom and learn all about the eight functions and the 16 types and the dichotomies and the transcendent functions and type development and type dynamics. And 
Sometimes that's what happens, isn't it? We have, um, not, no one in this room would ever do this, of course, but people end up in type workshops where they learn about type without experiencing what it really means for their lives. This wonderful theory that we all have at our fingertips, um, they only get a dose of it. And then we, those of us in this room who really know the theory, get them in another workshop. And what kinds of things do we get? We get, I've done type, I'm an ESPN. <laughs> no, that's, that's the television <laughs> Or we get, um, I've taken the MBTI four times and my type keeps changing, I'm balanced. Or I'm a me, and there's no one quite like me. You've never heard that, have you? Um, type is so last year, this year's disc. I don't know, you know, we get that one, or Hogan or whatever. I don't remember my code, but I was a yellow. It reminded me of a horoscope. Have you ever had that? Uh, or I hate labels. I refuse to be labeled. I don't want any part of that. Is another thing we often get, because type hasn't stuck. They haven't learned what it really means. You know, labels are actually a good thing. I love this quote. It was tweeted out by someone, and I have no idea who she is, but it said, putting labels on things is how people find the exit during a fire and make sure they're adding vanilla extract to cake instead of arsenic. <laughs> good labels are good things, and yet we're fighting an uphill battle because there's so many bad labels out there. Uh, I worked with a principal who used to blatantly tell her, to her teachers, you already label students. Let's put good labels on them. You talk about the lazy ones, the, um, the ones who you know, can't sit still, all those other labels. The, you know, we're going to use positive labels. Because um, now there are reasons to use um, animals or colors when we're doing workshops, especially when we're working with young people or when we're um, doing shorter term workshops. We've only got a little bit of time and we need to get just the idea to stick that there are good differences among people. But right now in Australia, there's a system that's competing uh, with the labels we use for the MBTI and for the other type instruments, and they use these four animal groups. And uh, it's called Oz Identities. And we were talking about this when I was down in Australia last month, because you can be an eagle. And um, this is an incredibly beautiful, swooping eagle that, that I've seen down there. Um, not a bad thing to be an eagle. You can be a kangaroo. Come on, you really can be. Why is this not? Okay, you can be a kangaroo, and um, all I want to say about kangaroos is, how do you develop? You know, if you're a hopper, how do you become a flyer? Can you see a limit in this sort of thing? And, you know, you can be a dolphin. Great. Kangaroos and dolphins will never in their lives have to work together. There's, there's just a limit in what you can do with the system. And then the biggest problem with how this one is set up is the other category is being a wombat. <laughs> wow. Jill Chivers, who's an Australian type person, and I were talking about this in the marketplace after the conference I was at, and the woman behind us said, I was a wombat. We were all wombats. Who wants to be a wombat? Okay? We don't want this happening. We can use good animals and things when we're working with certain groups, but if this becomes what people default to because they think type is too complicated or it didn't stick, we're creating more problems. We can't get at the richness of type. I mean, truly, how do a kangaroo and a dolphin stay married to each other? Think about that. Okay? So we don't want to go there. Um, the human brain loves patterns. We make patterns whether we like it or not. We categorize and define and actually you can't develop certain skills unless you've got that ability to find patterns. Uh, I tell people, you know, either you assume there's 8 billion people in the world that are all unique or you figure some ways to categorize and we're trying to help with good names on those categories. So um, we need to know that. We can change stereotypes into positive mindsets toward differences. We change last minute chaos, um, it's supposed to say perceiving down there. Um, somehow got lost. And we change control freak into judging. Um, we can change how people view each other if we're doing this right. And in order to do it right, I've been using a lot of concepts from this book called Made to Stick by Heath and Heath. Um, they talk about the idea that in, how many internet rumors can't be squelched again? Mm -hmm. They stick, right? And they say, well, we, I mean, we're not trying to spread an internet rumor about type, but we are trying to get people to remember these basic concepts. And they came up with six basic things that help you um, present, teach, present yourself in ways that ideas will stick. I thought about making a handout for this, but what I want you to know is you can Google this book 
and they have some free downloads. You have to put in your email, but I think I've gotten two emails ever from them. You know, they don't take it as a marketing window. Um, they have a, a handout on the basics of their, their stick method, uh, one on how to teach. They've got a little um, part you can listen to on how to present yourself better. So there's some nice handouts. Just go find what you want um, and, and keep it that way. But what, it, what do you need to do to make something stick? This is the basic. <laughs> Doesn't look too hard, does it? Making something simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional. And all the clever ones in the room will note that this spells success almost. They had to add a little S at the end there. But, you know, an acronym does help things stick if there's already been some content behind it. So that's the acronym we'll be working with today as we think about how to make things stick. And the first thing is making things simple. Folks, this is not simple. The type table simply isn't. And that's where we run into so many problems because either we take shortcuts or others do or they lose what they're thinking about and we end up with the things like the colors and the animals and the other labels when in some situations we're trying to do the deep development with the kangaroo and the dolphin and all of that. So um, we want to see how we can make things simple. And one of the biggest things that the Heath brothers bring out is this idea that the difference between an expert and a novice is the ability to think abstractly. Think for a moment back to when you first learned about personality type and someone was telling you, you know, that ESTPs are different from INFJs and everything else. How did you anchor yourself in those abstract concepts? I bet, like me, or if you, if you were taught by anyone who was in my circle, they told you when you finished your certification program to make a type table and to put names in it of people you knew to try and help you think, what is ESTP, what's INFJ? And you are actually taking those abstract things and making it concrete. It has nothing to do with sensing and intuition. When anyone is introduced to a very abstract concept, we take something to try and tag it to what we know in the concrete world. And we need to do a good job of doing this. So that's one of the things we want to remember about keeping things simple, is we've gone to the abstract stage with all this. And type was abstract to begin with, right? What is feeling? What is sensation? What is you know intuition? These are abstract concepts that we have to make real for people. So when we're trying to make something simple, you're trying to think about what can you subtract without losing the core message. How do you get it down to something that's small enough for people to get at and still make it robust and profound? That's the trick that we're going at. Has anyone read this book yet? Anyone besides me, The Big Short? Watch the film. Okay, well, we'll get there. Um, you know, this book is, is about the financial um, meltdown on Wall Street in 2008. And if you aren't a financial analyst, all you might want to know about it is that, you know, it's about money, and it's about greed, and it's about other things. But they made it into a blockbuster movie. How do you take something? I, okay, I have an MBA in finance, and I actually was working at the Federal Reserve when banks were first allowed to do off-balance sheet stuff. So. I was involved in research projects on the futures and options and forwards and CMOs and CDOs and all this other garbage, or, excuse me, all these other financial tools. Um, and I had a hard time getting through the book. And I thought, yeah, right, they're making it into a movie? How did they do it? Well, for one thing, they put Margot Robbie in a bowel bath explaining subprime loans and, and uh, shorting. Now, I'm not sure this was the best way to make things stick because I think some people might have been a little bit distracted from what she was saying. Um, but she did talk about, you know, subprime loans and shorting. And the big thing you need to know, she said they were all, um, I don't think I have to say the word. And, and that was the concept and that stuff. But the really good one for thinking about how do you be simple and profound is they brought in Anthony Bourdain to explain collateralized debt obligations. How many of you know what a collateralized debt obligation is? Funny thing, neither did I. So, let's say you've got your, your chef in a restaurant. And every day you get new fish. And you're not going to serve day-old sea bass when you've got fresh sea bass, right? But you're not going to throw the day-old sea bass away. And you've got two-day-old sea bass because it didn't sell out the day before. And you've got some salmon from three days ago. So you chop all that up. 
and you put it into a fish soup, stew and you serve it as if it's great fish. That's what a CDO is. Junk. All mixed together. Served. I think you might be able to remember that. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. Okay? And besides the fact, he's funnier than me. So it really stuck. <laughs> um, now, I'm not suggesting we turn everything into a comedy routine. But do you see the power of thinking about what's the simple concept? The simple concept in a CDO is that you've got old stuff mixed together. You know, stuff from different old instruments all tossed into one thing. He found the essence of it. Well, he didn't. And, and what they did in that movie was avoid what we call the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge is when you know so much, you don't realize what it looks like to someone who's just learning it. You don't understand that you've mastered all this stuff and that it needs to be broken down in new ways. For example, this is from the first page of Gifts Differing. And I could have picked on almost any type book out there. Um, Perceiving is here understood to include the processes of becoming aware of things, people, occurrences, and ideas. Judging includes the process of coming to conclusions about what has been perceived. Together, perception and judgment, which make up a large portion of, can you see how people might get lost? This is written at a 12th grade, year 12 reading level. It's pretty obvious to all of us because we already know what perception and judgment is. When my husband first looked at this, he said, you're kidding, right? You have two things in type theory that you call by the same names? Because you have the dichotomy of perception and judgment and then the perceiving and judging functions? Like, what idiot set this up, he said. Okay. He's not a type expert. It's just his natural reaction to something. We've forgotten how complicated it is, right? Or at all you know this, <laughs> how complicated it is. So what you're trying to do is figure out, we don't want to dumb it down, but we've got to figure out what's compact and core and it's to make it simple. So if I could have the lights back up again, because we're going to do a little bit of an exercise here. Um, this is one of the ways I've found to get teams understanding perception and judgment right from the start. I have lots of different um, stories or tools I might use, but I often just use a cartoon because we can do it quickly. So we're going to do this, and I'm going to borrow people. Um, I'm giving you a warning. If you're in the first two rows, somebody's got to volunteer, OK, um, to do this. And everyone's going to do it turning and talking, so we get a little interaction, OK? So this is the cartoon. Um, Kathy and, and Irving are uh, boyfriend and girlfriend, and Irving has to learn how to dress for business casual Fridays. Do you remember when that came out? OK, so Kathy's taken him to the mall, and she says, Want to have me put those on hold, Irving? Hold? You know, so you can think about it and come back. Come back? <laughs> yeah, after we uh, go to all the other stores and try on all the other ones, you can come back and try this one on again. Forget the clothes. How do I get out of the mall? And she says, great idea. We can go to the other malls and see what's there. <laughs> okay, now this is an example of the perceiving function. The rule is, if you make fun of one function, you have to make fun of the other one, too. And you can't leave one feeling worse. It's okay to joke about type. And actually, it can be a good thing because exaggeration um, makes things clearer. If we don't exaggerate a little bit, everyone can kind of see themselves in the middle. How many of you have ever overshopped for an item? Maybe gone too far before you purchased it? Am I the only one? Has anyone ever bought something too fast? Okay, so we all do a little bit of both. We've got to have some exaggeration so people get at this idea of what they prefer. And so I will immediately tell the story of um, one of my colleagues who noticed that his blue suit was uh, fraying a little bit at the cuff. He immediately went across the street to Brooks Brothers. Do you have Brooks Brothers here? Like the, it's the most mega expensive men's store in Minneapolis. He walked in, he walked up to the rack of navy blue suits, picked up one in his size, and bought it. It was a thousand pounds. Just bought the suit and went back to work. I thought that was, you know, like the antithesis of <laughs> Kathy. So we've got the two extremes. We just want to make that clear. And then I'll ask people, um, which describes you best? Are you, like Kathy, the kind that likes to have lots of options and possibilities? In the front row, is there anyone that's really in that category? You know, that cutting things off too fast makes you feel a little nervous? Is there anyone? Thank you, Catherine. Anyone else? No? Anyone in the second row or third row? Okay, Louise is going to come up and someone else. Okay, and then on the other side, 
There's the ones that always wait to see what the options are before they'll, um, here's a marker here. And on the other side, we have um, those of you who really do like to come to closure and move on. We have a few of those in the front row. Yes, Angelina, I knew you'd get up. We need a couple more, couple more people. Come on, I know we're in a more introverted country, but all right. So, what I'd like you to do is write down the three things you like most about your style. What's it like when you get to have all the options you want, you know, and do it, do life that way? And what's it like when you just get to come to closure and move on, make your choice and move on, and talk with each other? Top three things. What do you love about your own style? And in a workshop, I would tell people, if you aren't sure, watch the two groups, hear what they're talking about, see what they're doing. Yeah, talk about yourself and what you're suffering Those who like to have closure and move down went bada bing, bada bing, bada bing, and they've been standing there for about two, three minutes. Okay, and over here, Catherine just finished writing their last word. Is that boring? <laughs> each side and what they really have to offer to a team. So uh, why don't we let this group talk first about what do you love about having options and possibilities? Lots of options means lots of fun. Uh -huh. uh, it means freedom that you can adapt to the circumstances. If there are a lot of options, you can take whatever the best one is at that time. And third, we talked about it's almost like opening a present. There's this joy around the unexpected, the variety, the newness. Isn't that lovely? It's just a wonderful way to be. I'm not there, but that, that <laughs> uh, Over here on our Closure and Move On group, what do you love about your style? So you sort of get something sorted and you can move on to the next thing. So you actually uh, keep moving on and get lots of different things done. Yeah. You have lots of different, different experiences in a day. Lots of different surprises to open. It's just yeah. a great thing. And yeah. to sort out and put away and then go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now what I'd like you to do is actually take take your marker color with and go to the other chart and um, write down on the other chart what is um, discouraging or unsettling when you have to, for you to, come to closure quickly and move on without exploring all the options you'd like to explore and for you to staying open longer because there is no certainty and you can't come to closure. So switch charts and write down the three things that are most distressing to you. Go ahead and talk to each other about that. <laughs> Well, this is just real life. It is a world organized around closure, moving on, making decisions. And so we just have to say, okay, if necessary, we can go there, or we wouldn't be able to function. Um, it's a hard for us to let options go. There's a feeling of bereavement or loss at the things we can't do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even if they were only the possibility of doing them, or the image we had of what it would be like, it's hard. And we also don't like this when it seems like movement is just to tick something off the list, say it's done, and to move on, rather than we understand what the goal or the point is of making a decision right now, forever. <sighs> and on the other <laughs> side, <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes it can fun and all these sort of freedom and things, it can feel like wasting time, especially if we have to make a decision. At board meetings, we think we've decided on something, and then the peas, there's more and more <laughs> ideas they come out with. They're talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like just we're so sort of overwhelmed and overloaded with uh, information. Um, and really, we've usually already decided right at the beginning, but I think it's probably fair to say that uh, intuition comes into it as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we're not very good at adapting always. Well, and the, the lovely thing about doing it this way is that everyone's been hurt. Picture this on a team, um, and the, if I know a team, because I, I have their types from some other instrument, if I know the team is one-sided already, then I've got to pick something else to look at. This won't work in every situation, or I can fill it in myself, but we've heard the real strengths of each side, right? 
Most teams need a little more of one side or the other. And we've actually heard what they're afraid of. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing. Um, and it starts neutralizing this whole idea of um, what it means to operate in our preferences. But how many of you in the room have times when staying open to more information and going with the flow seems like a really good idea and really enjoy it? Is there anyone in here who doesn't have like vacation on the beach? You don't want to plan. You want to explore the options, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how many of you know some days that you just simply want to plan and to go by and get to the airport on the time and have the plane take off when you planned on it, not like Vicki Joe and Robert last night. Uh, sorry about that. Yes. Um, and so we all do a bit of both. We can get that idea across because type is an energy system. It is not a static um, preference that we have. A mature person knows when they need to go with the flow and when they need to uh, come to closure, and yet. Um, we still have a preference for one or the other, and, and so it rings true that way. But when we do this, we've actually gotten across the huge concepts of what perception is. S attending to the environment and all the possibilities and the information, and we've come to the idea of judgment, making a decision about those things. The big concept of type, and people are anchored in it on a team especially because they know the people involved. And they're anchoring it in their experiences of what's gone on. Now, there's a lot more to teach about perception and judgment. We often, you know, we have to go to, there's two ways of perceiving, sensing and intuition. There's two ways of judging, thinking and feeling. But they've got the core, profound message of perception and judgment. Do you see where we're going with this? We're avoiding dumbing it down, but we're not falling into that curse of knowledge. We're trying to make it real for people with these abstract tools that we're using. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It's one way. You can pick any of the preferences, but this one gets at the heart of type, that very complex thing that we're trying to do. If I can have my um, assistants. I don't think they have five women up here. So, uh, women will do what they have to. Okay. So that's where we're going. It is not dumbing down. It is very much keeping things compact and core to make them simple enough for people to engage and want to go deeper. Because that's what we want. We want to make sure they've got these ideas so they can go deeper. And one of the reasons we have to do this is because the MBTI does not work. It does not work. It sits there like a graveyard. Neither does the golden work, nor the new pyramid, nor the majors, nor the JTI. None of them work. They don't do a thing. You do the work. Right? It's what we do with these instruments that makes the difference. And people don't understand that out there in the other world. How many of you have had a call saying, I'd like you to come in and do the MBTI. We've got about 60 minutes, right? We do the huge work of um, ensuring the instruments and the training match to the time available. If I have an hour, I'm not using an instrument. I'm going to do something like this to make sure they want to do more. And you know, first do no harm. They're going to walk away understanding perception and judgment and something on the team and we won't have fallen into someone feeling labeled because they didn't have time to work through their whole report, right? Um, time available. What the client's needs and goals are. Have you ever had a client that really didn't understand what their goals were? <laughs> um, let alone when they call and say, yeah, we're doing um, new officer selection. Can you come in and use the MBTI? Well, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, your expertise. you know. How do I match what I'm really good at with type to what the client's needs are? I just turned over a, um, a young person who was looking for career counseling to another coach because that's not my specialty. Um, you know, I did, I actually took him through the MBTI to make sure I was matching him with the right coaches just to find more out because he was the son of a friend of mine and all of that. But um, you know, what else do you need to do? To make sure that what you're offering with one of the instruments we use matches up with what is really going on in the situation. That's the real work that gets things going. Um, and uh, because, you know, and, and then the worst of it is when we don't do a good job of this, then people don't even understand the power of the, the powerful instruments that we have, right? They think that free quiz on the internet is the, the equivalent. Um, and we know that's not true, okay? Which is the, 
I just tried to make something unexpected. I hope you were a little surprised. I hope you were surprised that I said the MBTI didn't work. Um, as I'm looking at Penny and Betsy in the back going, man, I don't want to live through this one. Um, because obviously, I love, especially step two, it's one of my favorite coaching tools in the world, just with how people react to seeing their facets and what I can do as they're, they're working with that. Um, but to make things stick, there's got to be something that triggers an unexpected reaction in people as you're working with them. If you want your core message to stick, um, Go, you know, sticking to tried and true doesn't really work because people just, um, they fall asleep. Is everyone awake now? <laughs> okay, um, there's a couple of really good ways to get people's attention. One is to play with what they expect. Um, and, uh, you know, I did that a little bit with the, if, if you know the golden ticket story of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, I was playing with what you expected a little bit by taking you into a classroom before you got to go see the chocolate waterfall and, um, all of that, which is quite different in the book. How many of you have read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Oh, some of you haven't. You, ha you, you can go down to the Doll Museum and buy it, you know, in the house that he lived in. And it's the most amazing, unexpected um, way of finding a golden ticket there is. You know Charlie's going to the Chocolate Factory. Why? It's, it's, called, it's called Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So how do you build suspense out of that? Well, you have him get his birthday chocolate bar from his parents that he gets every year because they're really poor. So that's his only Wonka bar of the year. Is the ticket in that? No. No. Is the ticket in the extra chocolate bar his grandpa sneaks him? No. Is the chocolate bar in? I'm not going to tell you anymore. He manages to build suspense when you know it's going to happen. It's a fabulous thing. Um, so you can play with what people expect. You can break a pattern. Do something just differently. Even taking a rhyme and twisting it so that it comes out differently can break a pattern in something. And you can introduce a mystery. That's actually how they pulled off the movie The Big Short. How is it that a few billionaire bankers can rook the rest of the world and get away with it? It's kind of a mystery, isn't it? It's kind of still a mystery at the end of the movie. But they sure <laughs> kept us um, paying attention to the whole thing. So that's number two is unexpected. And number three is making things concrete. We have, as I said, a very abstract theory, and we've got to figure out how to make it real to people. And again, this has nothing to do with sensing and intuition. This has to do with um, novice versus expert. I know tons and tons of sensing people who love type and use type. It's not about it being a theory or an abstraction. It's about how useful we make it. Um, and uh, they love the usefulness of type once they get to know it. So we want to remember this, that the difference between an expert and a novice is the ability to think abstractly. And we've got to figure out how to make these things concrete. Okay? How do we make it concrete? One is just with the people in the room, having people develop concrete memories from the experiences you give them. Of course, experience doesn't build knowledge. Reflecting on the experience builds the knowledge. You have to have an experience and take time to reflect on it, to really help people get the ideas to stick. This is why your facilitation skills are so important. Uh, one of the things I love to do when I'm working with schools is also teach the children about type. And then I have the teachers be my helpers as we facilitate things with the students. We took 130 11 year olds down to our media center one year and did the living type table with them. You know what the living type table is? We have everyone walk and split and you get everyone lined up with 16 types. How many of you are ready to do that with 130 urban 6th graders? <laughs> year olds? Yeah, we take the floor in advance. Um, we had the principal there, she had a whistle. Uh, we had six adults in the room. It actually went fantastically. We had just enough organization. Whether you're a uh, per uh, dominant perceiver or dominant judger, organization with 11-year-olds is a really good idea. <laughs> and um, so, so we had everyone sit down and we gave the instructions and then we had the extroverts go to the foot of the table and the introverts come to the uh, head of the table and the introverts all sat down again and the extroverts <laughs> did not. And the teachers said, oh my gosh. They are different. We need to accommodate. In, in that case, it was we need to accommodate the extroverts better. They saw the difference. And they started changing their classrooms really quickly because they concretely, um, this, this is a group of ENTPs, and they told the teacher, none of us want to sit still and work with the marker. So we're going to take turns writing with the marker, and the rest of us will do push-ups. 
you know, when it's not our turn at the marker to get our energy out. It was so good. Um, we had the write about who would be the final survivor and who'd get voted off the island. And uh, they're very good at that. The ISFJ said, um, we, we couldn't vote anyone else off, so, so we'd probably be the first to go. <laughs> um, the other thing we do is film people doing things that show the differences. Have you ever had an exercise not go very well? You know, that where people are mature enough or have enough skills that the difference isn't really good in the room? Um, and sometimes, especially if I'm trying to teach others how to work with type, like leaders or uh, others, I'll use film. So maybe we could turn the lights off again. I'm not sure who's by the lights that I'm making do all this work. Thank you. Okay. Um, we filmed uh, almost 100 students doing mathematical tasks. Uh, you can go watch my TEDx talk if you really like mathematics and Carl Jung. And all I was looking for was the differences. How do extroverted and introverted students, sensing and intuitive students, approach math? So they all were doing these fractions tasks. And these, these kids are all behind in, in learning for a lot of reasons. But this is an extroverted sensing boy. And you know, if you just give a list of how kids learn, it's hard to think about what it looks like to learn through purposeful trial and error or to need to interact with the environment. Okay? So watch this child make a shape that's a quarter red and three quarters yellow. He's got a rectangle drawn and he's drawing a little box off in the corner. He says, now I'm starting to get it. And then we remember to zoom up the camera so you'll be able to see his next move. And now he reads it again. <laughs> Needs another piece of paper, he says. Isn't that cool? That's purposeful trial and error. You got to make something happen to figure out what's going on. He's got those abstract words on the card. He's trying to match reality to those abstract words. Takes him three times, and he's got it. Okay? Didn't need help, just needed time, which is something we don't give kids much of in school, right? Okay, so now I want to contrast that. That was an extroverted sensor. Here's an introverted intuitive doing the same problem. Oh, no, wait. This is an um, introverted intuitive, and he's doing a more complex problem, but I want to show the opposite behavior. You saw the first child interacting with his materials. Watch how this boy solves it. He's an INTP, actually. This goes on for four minutes. <laughs> I'm not going to make you watch four minutes of it. And at the end of four minutes, he took the markers and drew the shape perfectly. Half red, third blue, one yellow tile, and one green tile. Some of you trying to still figure out what it would look like? Okay. The difference, sitting there, all in his head, trying to figure it out. And we have lots of these. You know, we have, we have statistical. Catherine actually helped me run all the the stats originally and do, the, do some of the work on it. You know, there's a statistical difference in how they did this stuff. Um, then we have um, another example of, we, we talk about the improvisers and how they, you know, just work with things and, and use what they have in order to get a solution and think on their feet. So this little boy, he'd never done a problem with thirds and sixths before in the same equation. And he said to us, well, I can only use three tiles if it's thirds. How am I going to get six in there? Because I can't use six tiles if it's only three. And he said, well, can I break a tile? And we said, well, you, you can, but you, or you may, but you probably can't. And so this is what he did. <coughs> you know, and we pointed out that he's not going to be able to do that on a computer-aided learning um, program. You know, it actually doesn't suit them in a way. They can't do the same sorts of experiments and improvs like you saw in the two extroverted sensing kids. And now, watch how this, this introverted intuitive girl, um, not playing with the, well, she does play with the environment, but she does it in a different way to make a shape that's a quarter red and three quarters yellow. Mm -hmm. 
Do you think that's why I had three yellow markers in that basket? She wanted to do it uniquely. She wanted to do it differently than anyone else had done it all day. Uh, only the introverted intuitives drew triangles out of the 60-some kids that we had to do this. Um, only they did it with hexagons. Um, they did everything they could to do it different. And um, she told me that last year she'd been on the ceiling of her class and this year she was on the floor. Because it was all worksheets and they were so boring. So we've got these concrete pieces of what it looks like. Do you have a better picture of what sensing and intuitive looks like? I hope from these kids either working with the materials or not working with anything. And that's what we're trying to get across to the teachers. When we're talking about team building, how many of you have done things like draw your ideal office? It makes it concrete and then we have to take it to application to make it more concrete. Um, this was an office drawn by a group of extroverted perceivers. I often um, use the uh, attitudes to get at our work environments. So you can see they've got a list of what they'd like in their, their office, like natural lights and plants and color and water features and um, people and books and the fun monkey um, is up on the tree there. So that's the extroverted perceiver room. Uh, the I introverted and judgers made a list too. But now it's things like doors, walls, soundproof things, <laughs> pictures, and here's their room. And then they, uh, they added, they were all introverts, of course, so they added their e-greeter right there. Um, now, it's all tongue-in-cheek, but then the conversation needs to become even more concrete on, all right, we're stuck with our office. We can make some changes. What can we do to accommodate these two different groups? And, of course, there were two more. Making it concrete, going from differences to what are we actually going to do to work better together is what we've got to make as the next step in taking that time to do that. Has anyone ever worked with uh, people in those two groups trying to get along? <laughs> it's so fun. Another thing we can do to um, make things concrete, um, it's so fun to see what's evolving in the world of type. The tools that are on the tables out there, you've got uh, CP, or OPP, sorry, um, OPP's, what do you call it, the, the flip book for communication? <laughs> flip a type tip where the, the concrete things that people can quickly do. I'm, I'm an ESTJ and I've got to talk to an ESFP. You know, flip to those and look quickly at what are the concrete things I can do to change my style quickly. It's right there in front of them. Sue Blair's cards where you can have people concretely move around their type and look at the how, how to get at things. These are posters made from um, Cindy Stengel Paris's new material. She's here. Um, at, this is your first BAT conference, right? It is. I know it is because it's your first trip to England. Um, and uh, this was a workshop I did with a bunch of leaders where we did not have time to use a type instrument. And what Cindy's posters do, um, this isn't an advertisement, I'm just getting at this, well yeah it is, because they're yeah, really cool. Um, she has them on cards. I just want to let you know about these new tools, because I don't think you've seen these before. But she's got how people effectively use the function and how they ineffectively use the function. And so it's both on the poster, and then we hung them with the opposite functions next to each other. So extroverted sensing was hanging with introverted intuition, and extroverted feeling was hanging with introverted thinking. And in this very short workshop, we just asked these leaders to walk around and look. And we said, in each pair of posters, one of these is going to be more like you, and one of these is going to be more diff diff difficult for you. Take a look. Think about what happens in leadership. The discussions were so rich, just with these simple phrases, that we ran overtime on it. You know, my colleague Ann, Ann Holm, who, who really would like to be here and says hi to all of you, she was here last year. Um, so we, we were joking that she's saving up her scone allowance so she can come next year. But, um, <laughs> but at any rate, we, we couldn't break off the conversations because they were too good with leaders going, yeah, this is my blind spot. I got in trouble this way last week. Making it concrete even before they learn more about type. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Got to figure out how to make it concrete and make it credible. Have you noticed that we're picking up some flack about the great work that we do? <laughs> that um, I have, Catherine and Cindy and I have been passing back and forth new attacks. Um, and the, the, the attacks on, on the work of type all come from some similar themes, and most of them don't really understand how the instruments are supposed to be used, right? I'm talking about blogs from Adam Grant mm -hmm. saying goodbye to the MBTI and um, other things like that. Um, we want to make sure we're being credible. 
And there's, there's actually a lot of ways to do it that don't involve tons of research. One is what we call testable credentials. Did this commercial ever make it to the UK, or were you spared? There's three old women in it. They're at the Big Bun hamburger shop. And uh, they're going, well, yeah, it's a big bun. And then they open up the bun, and the woman on the, right go, or on the left goes, where's the beef? Where's the beef? And it's a testable credential. Any of you can go into a hamburger shop and try and find the burger. You know, in the commercials, it looks like this big, juicy piece of meat. And you get to the fast food restaurant, and what does your burger look like? Yeah, yeah, so you know, it's hiding into the pickle. Is it really there, or is that the, you know, that's a testable credential. Another really famous one came in, um, I didn't think I'd talk about politics twice, but in the 1980, um, no, yeah, 76. What year was it? No, 80. 80, yeah, because I was in college. Okay. Um, at the end of the Reagan-Carter debate, Ronald Reagan turned to the audience and said, ask yourself, are you better off today than you were four years ago? That's a testable credential. Mm -hmm. And most people, you know, we just, we, 76 to 1980, we were at the height of the last big recession with interest rates at 18%, and um, people, obviously answered no and voted for Carter, it didn't net, 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 net grace. In our own work, we can figure out something that clients can test. You can say, test this, go and do this. I tell teachers, go to your classroom and ask a question and wait five seconds and see if you get more responses from more kids. And guess what, they do. And they come back and they want to do more. I do this with leaders too, I say, Go to, you know, if, if they're um, having trouble with team feedback and other things, I'll say, go to a meeting, put out an idea, and just wait. So I had an INTJ leader do this. Um, she was having trouble with one of her teams, partly because she wasn't there that office. And uh, the next time I was in the, in the building, she, she called me over and said, she, I did. <coughs> I went to a meeting, and I sat down, and I said, here's what I'm thinking about. Who has some input? And I sat there, and I listened. And then she went, eh. <laughs> and she said, and it worked. I got all kinds of ideas, and they thanked me for listening. And they emailed me with more ideas afterwards. She said, um, this is wonderful. I need to do more of this. Testable credential. Make them go try something simple. Does that make sense? This is what we have to do. It's, it's the easy way to get at credentialing. Um, it's not the only thing, though, that we need to do. Um, let's turn up the lights for a second again, thank you. Um, there's an instrument called the Hogan. It's actually a series of three instruments, and it's one of our biggest sources of competition right now. It's a very different instrument. First thing I'd like you to do is read this, and then turn and talk for a second. What words are in their advertising that might appeal to the 70% of the population out there that prefer sensing? Can you read it? Yeah. Okay. Stop, chat for a second. Well, here's, here's some of their research. This is just the studies on their website from 2007 to 2008 that show how it, a stronger return on investment in training after implementation. They publish a report like this every single year showing their um, reliable, valid, published studies showing that when you use these assessments and training in your organization, these are the kinds of results. So a government organization, three times increase in performance, transportation drivers, 16% drop in accidents, uh, para pharmaceutical, three times more ready for advancement, greater success potential, $175,000 increase in sales, double the performance, 30% reduction in turnover after they use the Hogan, uh, doubling their new accounts, Eight million in sales return on investment. They have those numbers out there. You can argue with them. They've got these numbers out there. Okay? I want you to look at their advertisement again and think about what words have nothing to do with our goals for type. Predictive. I'm oh, sorry. Selection. Predictions. Yeah. We don't do those things. We say constantly type doesn't predict behavior or performance, it predicts patterns. But it will not tell you about an individual because individuals can develop and change and adapt behaviors and type is about the patterns that we can use to help them do that even more rapidly, right? And we also aren't involved in selecting for hiring because the instruments say nothing about skills, right? Or 
qualifications. So we aren't trying to do what this instrument is trying to do, mm -hmm. and yet this is our biggest competition. They are using, uh, if, you, if you read their uh, advertising, it's a direct hit to things that we cannot claim. Mm -hmm. They have these huge paragraphs describing um, their, the inventors of, or the, the creators of the Hogan. Um, their PhD credentialing, their business uh, credentialing, all the studies that they've done, all the research, their psychology degrees, all of that kind of thing. And of course, Isabel Myers was not a psychologist. Mm -hmm. They're actually placing themselves you know, directly against us, and we have to be aware of this. We're in the world of big data. Who knows what big data is? Mm -hmm. You know, people can track and record everything that's going on. There's a fabulous, is this display still on in London, the exhibition on big data? I didn't have time to go find it. I've got a slide in here from it. Um, but uh, you know, we have to be cognizant of this, that a lot of companies now expect us to have this kind of data. You know, well, if we bring in this tool and your training, what's the impact going to be? What's the return on training? What's the, what's the return on our investment? Um, even though our goals are different, we're being judged in this way. And we can't change how people are looking at things. We have to be able to answer these questions and be credible. How many of you have been in a type world long enough to know what these blue volumes are on the bottom here? JPT? The Journal for Psychological Type. This used to come out bi-monthly, right? It wasn't monthly, it was every other month. It was monthly, 12 times a year with four or five, you know, jury journal articles with research about the MBTI. These three next books are proceedings simply from the education conferences that used to be held. Those three volumes there are filled with white papers, not publishable journal articles, but research people had done describing what they learned about type and education. Every year there was a leadership conference collecting proceedings <coughs> like that. Every other year there was a mind, body, and spirit conference uh, counts, uh, collecting work like that from counseling and spirituality and everything. The next volume up is what conference proceedings used to look like with these robust white papers that tracked what people had learned and what they'd done. And that top spiral bound notebook is from the last printed conference proceedings. And it's basically a bunch of PowerPoint handouts. And I'm not saying we want to go back to these huge volumes. What I'm saying is we're doing even less tracking of the research we used to do than we used to. Does that make sense? <laughs> we're not tracking research well. We're a bunch of practitioners out there doing great things, competing with people who are tracking the success of what they're doing. And it's really starting to hurt what's going on. Because I don't want to use the Hogan in team building. Can you imagine lining up a group along their hedonism scores? <laughs> it's just, it, there's really good things about the Hogan, don't get me wrong. And it is, does have a predictability piece, and it does do other things. But it does not do the same thing that we can do with psychological type. You know, it's that old barbed wire fence. It's a trade instrument um, and very different. Uh, I wish this book had come out before I did my dissertation because Rowan Bain has done a lot of work for us in figuring out what kind, what do we really know about Jung's whole theory? What have we validated, you know, for uh, type dynamics on the eight functions and all those kinds of things and what work still needs to be done? And I noticed in it that he kindly suggested what I should have done on a research project that I finished in 1999. So if I'd read it, you know, I would have, it didn't exist when I did my dissertation. But there's a lot of stuff in there on what we could be doing to uh, make ourselves more credible. What do we have now that makes us more credible? I can tell you that um, I couldn't get this published in a journal. The, the research I did on students in mathematics. It is a TEDx talk. I think getting 7,000 hits on something about Jung and math is pretty good. Um, you know, it's not, it's not uh, what's her face in a bathtub, so I'm never going to compete with that. But, um, you know, what has helped me gain even more traction, and actually what the original talk was about, of course, added in Dario's work. Um, and when I can show Dario's brain image of an extroverted sensing type in the tennis hop mode, where every little bit of the brain is just a little bit turned on until something happens in the environment. And then I can show that little boy drawing and making something happen in the environment. My credibility goes way up because neuroscience is hot. You know, two years ago, Rob Toomey said, let's just clone Dario. Um, you know, that getting grounded in what he has is one of the ways I gain credibility. If I show two of his brain slides 
uh, when I'm trying to sell a, a type, uh, what do you call it, an intervention, it increases my credibility. It's one of the things we've got going for us. We all need to be tracking what we're doing, where it makes a difference. These are the kinds of responses I got trying to get um, stuff going in education. Head of uh, a large research in a large school district, when we were trying to get a $300,000 grant, said, there's no data that supports using personality assessments to drive instruction. I believe it would be a waste of money. And I'd like to say we did get the grant um, until Congress cut it in half. But um, that was what we were bucking, was this idea. And there's a, one of the major um, education presenters is going around saying the MBTI was never meant to be used in education. It's for business. When in truth, you know, there's a whole chapter in Gifts Different. It was Isabel Meyer's dream to help mm -hmm. teachers and students and parents understand these, these differences. Um, and so we've got to somehow up our credibility, and we're all working on that. I'm just afraid if we don't pay attention to these things now, we could be looking at a really bleak future because mm -hmm. some of our competition, different as they are, are beating us on this front, and it's an important front in this world where data is ruling. Now I hope that had a bit of an emotional impact on you, because that's the next one, is somehow keying into people's emotions. And just like concrete is not just about sensing and intuition, our emotions are not about thinking and feeling. All good decisions, almost all good decisions involve both, right? The objective and the subjective. The only decision I can think of that you only really need thinking for is child running out in front of car, grab child. You know, you do not have to worry about <coughs> damaging their personhood or anything else. You just grab the child. You know, on the feeling front, there are some things that happen where all we care about are the feelings of people. You know, like a tragedy in the office or something. You don't worry about getting tasks done during the day. You just focus on everyone's emotions. Most of the time, we need both. And the research, again, that's coming out of neuroscience, it backs up thinking and feeling as absolutely separate processes if we, that don't function at the same time. If we're being objective, we lose our subjectivity. We lose access to our emotions. If we're using our emotions, we are not using logic. There are two separate areas of the brain. One shuts down when the other is functioning. We kind of know this because we use it as protection sometimes for ourselves on either side. But think about the impact on leadership. They're saying, well, we need an ROI impact to figure out what to do um, with training. And they're not thinking about the emotion side and what we've got to offer. Or um, the commitment to coaching, if they're stuck on all the data side. Or um, the time and the resources for team building and development. We've got to somehow trigger their emotions so they realize the important part of all this. And um, just, just to back up this whole idea, we're not talking about touchy-feely or solipsisms or you know somehow manipulating people we're trying to help the idea stick that's where we're going with this and when we get new information it triggers new ideas those new ideas sit in our working memory you know that place where you hold a phone number or you used to until your cell phone or mobile held it how long do those things stay in working memory unless there's some sort of a connection you know when we were all Oh, it's only been 20 years since for me, right? Since I was worried about you know holding onto that phone number of that nice guy I met or whatever, um, or whatever you know. But either something gets out of working memory and goes into the trash, and our brains are constantly trying to get stuff out. We've actually found that um, you know the brains are trying to forget um, information we don't need anymore, unless there's somehow a hit to the emotion connection pres uh, pleasure center. When we have an aha moment, then it sticks with us. So hopefully Anthony Bourdain and the fish stew is sticking with you on the CDOs. Um, and then it goes into our long-term memory. We want to do this with type, too. Make sure it goes to people's long-term memory in some way. Um, even having people stand along continuums, like I talked about, often the sticky emotional part is seeing a colleague that's maybe saved them. It's like, we're opposites, and that's why I needed you so bad in that project. I'm going to remember that we're different and we need to work together again. Something happens when they do those concrete things that helps them remember. Um, it's actually easy to do with type. All you have to do is form an association between something they already care about and type. So with this team building with a group of young folks that were going to be working together all summer, they were going to be living together, they were going to be 
um, working with adults and children together. They were going to be cleaning up the camp together. If you get a job, at this job, you know, you're just together all summer long. 20 adults, 20 people in close quarters. Can you see where they might have problems getting along? They care about getting along and having a good summer. And so they were very eager to work hard learning about type. Uh, this team, we did, we've got something called our brain energy and bandwidth quiz now, looking at how things like checking emails and worrying about um, resource shortages and everything else, how that affects people's efficiency and ability to focus. This team all scored in the problematic range. They live in five different states. They're doing all kinds of conference calling and emailing and web meetings. And they're all having trouble focusing and being efficient, getting things done. They cared about that. They need to get their lives back together. And they were very easy to work with. When I made the connection between let's figure out type and how to work together better. Uh, another client I had, he'd been given me as a coach, he'd been given a promotion and told if he didn't change, he'd be fired. Uh, he was their top salesman and didn't get along with anyone else in the office. And when he took the MBTI, um, do you think he was a thinking type or a feeling type? He was a thinking type, um, a top-notch technical salesman. Um, and uh, he, we also worked with emotional intelligence and his, his uh, empathy score was like this tiny little fingernail out of a bar graph, you know, that could have been this long. And he said to me, oh my gosh, that's exactly what's going on the home front. You know, I need a window into how to get on with my three daughters. If I, do, if I do that well, and hey, my wife will coach me well. She is eager and waiting to coach me. Um, I bet I can learn how to do it at the office. That emotional connection for him was with his children and knowing. And do you know how well it worked? Do you know how motivated he was with that connection? Two weeks later, I got a call from his boss saying, so did you switch people <laughs> Um, it had nothing to do with me. It was his, well, yeah, it did, but not, I mean, not totally. It was much more his motivation and type, showing him how to move through type. How has type helped you? You know, I learned about type seven into, uh, years into our marriage. This is our 35th anniversary this year of uh, INFJ being married to an ESTP. We learned about type at about the time our second child was born, and I can't tell you how valuable it's been in us getting along all these years and making it work. Because once you have two children, you need a schedule, and you also need to go with the flow. Um, anyone doubt that? <laughs> you know, one child you can cover for each other. Two, there's a lot of negotiating to do. And uh, I love my, my husband's favorite, my favorite line from my husband is, once again, we're in violent agreement, aren't we? Because we communicate so differently. Type has saved our lives. And then we have these kids. You know, and if you, if you have opposite preferences, it's just, it, it's going to happen. Your kids are going to be as different as you are. So our household is actually a female version of Obi-Wan Kenobi, married to Han Solo, with Luke and Leia as children, and Queen Amidala marrying in this summer. <laughs> okay. Um, type has been invaluable for how they get along and how they've grown. Our kids both know their type. I think I deserve a gold medal for not typing my future daughter-in-law until she asked me last May. Uh, I don't touch it. Isn't that good? I knew she was Jay, but um, I didn't know anything else. So, um, how real is it to them? My my 25-year-old daughter often babysits. Um, she's an ENTJ. She's the Princess Leia, get that walking carpet bag out of my way, uh, daughter. And uh, she babysits her two, her cousin's two daughters. Uh, Allie's nine and an ISFJ, we're pretty sure. And then little Ashley, the four-year-old, is another ENTJ, we're pretty sure. So Mari has them for the weekend, and she comes home and says to me, Mother, please tell me I was not that obnoxious to my brother when I was little. No wonder he didn't want to play with me. I owe my brother so many apologies. Type has been very important to us. Um, my work in schools. This group of students, when I first got to that school, um, the teachers said 20% will fail no matter what they do. 20% will fail. We cannot help them. If we do something else, it'll be a different 20%. Guess what the failure rate was at the end of the project, two years in? On big projects, we had the failure rate down to zero. Every single kid at that school was completing their big reports and history days and all those kinds of things. Um, because the teachers got it and then learned how to work. 
uh, in a different way with every child. It was amazing. Um, how was tight made a difference? Um, the work in spirituality with people realizing that um, they hadn't been in a sort of spiritual environment that nurtured who they were and that that's why they couldn't find a spiritual connection and that there were ways for them to do it. I want you to take 30 seconds in silence to think about how type has made a difference for you. 30 seconds here. And then I want you to think about how you made a difference with type. And I'm going to give you five minutes to do that. So I want you to turn and talk with each other. How you made a difference with type? Go ahead, celebrate it. Turn and talk to someone. All did, right? And that is actually um, one of the things we want to remember. We are a community of practitioners. This is Stan Sullivan presenting two years ago. And our beautiful stories of type and, uh, in, and the world of type. We are a community of practitioners, very good at changing the world one engagement at a time. You've just heard evidence of that. We're fabulous at it. We have all kinds of success stories. We have not been a community of researchers gathering evidence that what we do makes a difference. I'm just as guilty as anyone else. I have a few pieces. I haven't pulled it together. You know, I actually remember a dominant perceiver. And that means that I get about 95% done and go on to the next exciting thing. You know, I don't always bring it to closure either with the kind of papers and things that would, would do it, even though um, I've got that J at the end of my name. And the last thing that makes things stick is stories. Is. We can use our qualitative research. We can get our stories out there on the differences it makes. If we can collect some data to go with it, we'll hit both parts of the brain. But this is their sixth piece is the stories we have to tell. Um, I think of that, that amazing story that was in the Oz, OZAT journal a few years ago about the couple that had gone to counseling and they'd been told that their MBTI types were incompatible and they should just give up their marriage. And fortunately, they said it to the right person. And at the next, they danced into their next counseling session together. That's the kind of thing that we want the world to know. Simple stories. I wish we had time to hear them all. Maybe we can share some more at break with different people. Um, you also, uh, this, I love this little picture of Isabel Meyer. So often we see the very formal ones, but I love the spirited picture of this INFP excited about her work. Who I cut out was Mary McCauley standing with her, her, her co-researcher, because I wanted you to focus on Isabel. But, you know, she said, it's not too much to hope that wider and deeper understanding of the gifts of diversity, of type, may eventually reduce the misuse and non-use of these gifts. It should lessen the waste of potential, the loss of opportunity, the number of dropouts and delinquents. It may even help with the prevention of mental illness. And I think of what's going on in a world that's actually trying to get everyone to be more and more the same and realize how much more they need what we have to offer that's very different from what's going on with some of the other tools. You. This is a slide um, from the big data display, and I know you can't read it. What it is is a series of statements about what data can and can't do. So let me just read you a couple to power you up to think about stories. Data can help astronomers search for signs of alien life, but will it help us know if aliens are friendly or mean? It will help cardiologists monitor pacemakers with Wi-Fi connections, but will it keep hackers from hacking our hearts? It will help Virologists publish the genomes of major diseases, but will it keep terrorists from developing weaponized strains? It will help soldiers kill enemies remotely with drones, but will it help us see war as more than a game? This goes on and on with that push me, pull you of our heads and our hearts that we, I think, could have an impact on. So, the S stands for simple. What does the U stand for? Unexpected. Unexpected. Remember that one. Good. <laughs> what about the first C? Concrete. Concrete. What about the next C? Incredible. Incredible. What about the E? Emotional. Emotional. And the S? Stories. Stories. It's not that hard to remember, is it? That's what we need to do. 
He also brought this English major to England in the 400th anniversary <coughs> of the death of Shakespeare. And I was trying my darndest to see how I could stay around for another two weeks and <laughs> be there. And so, you know, I am married, and he, he, as he says, he didn't get married to be home alone. So, um, you know, we're out of time. But we do have a simple, unexpected, credible, emotional, concrete story to tell, right? Just like the bar got us to stories that have lasted all these years by doing many of the same things. Let's go do it as a community. Thank you for your time and let's have a great conference for you.